Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Zen Shuji 100th Anniversary Lecture Series. Uh, this is the final one. We started the, from the January. Now, November, it's me 11th one. And this is a very final. And we have a very special guest speakers. And we are expecting her to be here for this Jukai too. As you see, my background, Zen Shuji stage is a little bit changes, right? There's some red and uh, the stage is bigger than before with stairs. Now we are already uh, start preparing the uh, Jukai uh, ceremonies will start 16th of November. And this is a very 100th anniversary moment. Uh, we uh, reflect 100 years of the history of Soto Zen in North America. And especially today, uh, she has a knowledge for entire story about Soto Zen in United States. So Dr. Long Krasige, could you introduce the, our special guest speaker for the final? Sure. Is this the right spot right here? Yes. Okay, welcome. Welcome everyone to our final uh, monthly lecture for the 100th anniversary lecture series. Um, and before I introduce Godwin Sensei, let me thank everyone who's helped produce this, this series, starting of course with Kojima Sensei, who, as we've talked about before, is the, the kind of, it's his idea. He's the, the brainchild behind this this 100th anniversary lecture series. And uh, Atsuko uh, Kubota has been the brilliant woman behind all the beautiful flyers that you see, as well as the guiding force behind the Zazen Kai, Zen Shuji's Zazen Kai. She's been president for, for many, many years now. And we're John and I, John Flores is right here. Do you want to come say hi, John? <laughs> say something. Hello, I'm John Flores. Thank you all for joining us in our uh, series this year. It's been uh, quite a great uh, experience. Oh, thank you. So thanks to John, of course, too. We're all three of us are the triumvirate presidents of the, the Zen Shuji Zazen Kai. Um, certainly, thank you to all our speakers. Amy Honjo is in the audience right now. So I'm looking at Angel, uh, Amy as the representative for all of our wonderful uh, intelligent speakers, stimulating speakers. And then thank you to all of you, the audience, who have been here to Zen Shuji and followed us on Zoom and maybe watched us uh, on YouTube. Um, so let me introduce uh, Godwin Sensei right now. Uh, since 2003, she has been the abbot of the Houston Zen Center in Houston, Texas. Although we were just talking, she was proudly born and raised in California. Um, and she began her Zen training in 1985 at the San Francisco Zen Center under Shinru Suzuki, or in his lineage, um, where she received Tokudo. She moved to Texas uh, at the beginning of the Houston Zen Center in 2003 and helped found the center and is responsible for the name Shounji, Auspicious Cloud Temple. Uh, Shounji is now a thriving urban temple uh, with about 200 members. Reverend Godwin has been appointed Kai Kyoshi and in 2018 became the director of the International Center of Zen or Soto Zen Buddhism in North America. She trained monastically for more than 12 years at Tassajara Zen Mountain Center, plus six more years in residence at Green Gulch Farm Zen Center, all in the Bay Area, California. She also trained in Japan at Hoshinji with Harada Seke Roshi and Zuionji as well, um, and then as well with Robert Aiken Roshi at Diamond Sangha in Hawaii. Reverend Godwin travels extensively to maintain relations with other Zen temples throughout North America. So without further ado, here's our final speaker, Reverend uh, 
God wouldn't sense that. Thank you. Thank you all. So good to see you here. And it's good to be at Zen Shuji. Thank you, Reverend Kojima Sama. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful series. So uh, I have seen all but one of the preceding lectures, and I was inspired and moved. And I really think they should be required viewing for everybody. So thankfully, they've been recorded. Really wonderful series. Thank you, Amy. I loved your show. I went down to uh, your show, your lecture. I went to Anzen Hardware today and <laughs> bought a set of Bokashi to <laughs> figure out how to get that back to Houston. And thank you, Lon. Thank you, Professor Kurashigi. Thank you so much. I just have loved this. And John, so preparing for this lecture series and Zen Shuji. Zen Kai. I'm very moved and very honored to be part of this series. I, uh, in the preceding, um, oh, first I want to say something that mine is, my lecture is titled The Present and Future of Soto Zen, which is quite a challenge because I'm uh, not very good at predicting the future. In fact, that kind of makes me a, a good Zen person because I really like being in the present and then we see what happens in the future. But I do have some things I would say about what I hope for the future and I, one of the main things is that our future is dependent on, the, on us learning about our past. So everything that we've been learning and hearing, especially the work of Professor Duncan Williams has been transformative for our practice. And for me personally, this has been a major learning experience. So this series, which honors the 100th anniversary of the founding of Zen Shuji, is such a wonderful opportunity to open up our eyes and hearts to what's happened to Japanese and Japanese American people in the United States. And I've, as I said, I've been transformed by hearing this. And I know that everybody around America has had their eyes open to it. Um, in fact, one of the things that Taiga Ito, who's in the International Center with me, one of the things that he and I have been doing as we travel around the country is talking about this, talking about the 100th anniversary in terms of our, our opportunity to understand our past. So that's the uh, past. And now I'm going to talk about the present. I do want to say that um, I was really kind of inspired and moved by the things that people said about their own practice experience. So I did include a little bit of myself. This is me being in, uh, ordained in 1991. I showed this to one of our members and he said, you've really changed. <laughs> in some ways, yes, but not in many other ways. And then um, I did go to Hoshinji. I feel so lucky. This is one of our toku, toku, tak, takuhatsu, excuse me, little tired, takuhatsu, heading out to um, beg for rice. And Daigaku Rume is leading us out. And I love that practice. I wish we could do that practice in the States. It's a very humbling and yet loving relationship with people as you go around receiving a little container of rice that they've harvested with their own hands. And then this is me with uh, jo uh, Jisoji-san. She, she had a little temple nearby, and this is make, forming, the right, forming the mochi for New Year's. I was really good at it. She was really impressed because I knew how to bake bread. It's basically the same technique. So I, she was great. And this is me making a bouche de Noel for Harada Seki Roshi. He, he liked it. So that's a little bit about my past. I, I was born in San Luis Obispo and raised in Cayucas. And when I say those words in Houston, it basically has no meaning. But I know you guys understand. And I was very influenced as several of the speakers were, including Amy, by the 60s, because I'm of that age. And the 60s were influential, not just because of the openness and the challenges to conformity that were happening then, but because of the war and because of the violence and because of the assassinations. And I, as I was thinking about this lecture uh, going forward, I was thinking, you know, possibly in about 50 years, somebody will be standing up here or in the audience and they will be saying, I started practicing because of the terrible pandemic and the uh, uh, 
religious intolerance and the division in the country. And I, like, like I, went to San Francisco Zen Center just to want to meditate. Maybe they'll say, I came to Zen, Zen, Zen Shuji just to meditate. And then I stayed and became a person of Zen. So I think in 50 years that will happen because we were driven out of our comfort zones and we had to do something. And the teachings of Buddhism made the most sense at that time. So now um, to a little bit of discussion of the present. I, the, um, this talk arose because I, one of my connections was with a um, really nice uh, priest named Ryoki Sato. Have you met Ryoki Sato? He's very nice. He has a temple in Iwate, and he had come to help his Dharma sister in Vermont, Shaoshan. She was having her mountain seat ceremony, and they had trained at her master's temple in Japan. So he came to help, and I met him. And it was the year after the Great East Earthquake, and he was still stunned by it. So he made a good connection as he told me what it was like to almost be washed away during the earthquake, standing on a truck while the waves washed back and forth. And the reason the truck wasn't washed away was because it was full of rocks. So he, it really deepened his practice. And eventually, um, when the next time I went to Japan, I asked if I could visit him in Iwate. And he said, yes, and will you give a talk to the Young Buddhist Association of Ministers about Zen in America? Mm -hmm. So I said, sure. And I decided, it seemed to me, the best thing would be to have some pictures. So this was the first form, and it's changed a little bit, but this was what I wanted them to know. And I can say after I made the presentation and uh, Honshu Wender was there too, um, they said, amazing, in America, you're really doing Zazen. <laughs> they had no idea, you know. They knew about Zen Shuji and Sokoji, but they didn't know that all across the continent, people were actually doing Zazen together. So they liked that. And in the group of 40, there were three women, and we made a good connection. And all of them are uh, taking care of temples, and they're all in Iwate, north part of Japan. And yet you could feel they, they felt connection with what we're doing here. So this is, um, I do have a fair number of images. Um, so I will go through some of them rather quickly, and in some of them, I will stop and say something about the issues that came up in previous parts of this lecture series, because I was, again, so moved by the series. So here we go. You know this history, Hawaii, and then Zenshuji and Sokoji, and uh, Taiga, Taiga Ito put all the characters on here. Thank you, taiga -san. So we were able to make it clear. I explained Isobe, which I don't have to do with you all. So you know the importance of Hosen Isobe-san. And there it is. Cute picture. I learned a lot, though, from this series, a little bit more about him. And starting in the, in the uh, living room nearby, that was amazing. And that will help me when we go around and talk to groups in, the, in our country, because a lot of people think they have to start with the temple. But no, you can start in a living room, and then eventually, if people are really devoted to the temple and just work diligently, you end up with something this big. And then we have to take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> but starting in a living room is fine. So we know that um, Maizumi Roshi came here to assist in this temple. And he would say, I knew him, he helped me go to Japan when I eventually went to Japan. And he would say, I served at Zen Shuji for 15 years before I went to establish Z ZCLA. That was important for him. He wanted it to be known. He served in a temple. He didn't just go off and start this new thing. He served here. And then a few years after he had arrived, Suzuki Roshi arrived and took care of Sokoji. And, oops, there he is. And there is San Francisco Zen Center, which also you, was discussed in the earlier lecture series. Um, new information for the people in Japan and Tassajara Zen Mountain Center, where um, I did live for many years. And these are all important teachers. And what I 
one of the things that moves me, and I like people to know when they hear about this, all of these amazing, wonderful people, Kobenchino, Katagiri Roshi, Suzuki Roshi, Kobenchino again, and, oh, excuse me, Katagiri Roshi here, so they're duplicates, but they came to this country and then they died in this country. They gave their creative life energy to establishing Zen in the West. And that's very moving. So I bow to them. This is amazing what they did. So this is a little thing. I had sound on it before, but I took it off because it just pop, 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 pop. <laughs> Roshi, so Khan has arrived. So this has little pops. These are almost all, but not all, of the temples that are associated with the Suzuki Roshi lineage. Some of them small, some of them big. And uh, I've, the Canadian ones aren't on here, and there are a few more in Mexico. So some of these are big temples like San Francisco Zen Center. Some of them are just little groups, but they're everywhere, except we need a few more. We need South Dakota. <laughs> We need a few. However, some of these states are then covered. It's interesting, the coastal distribution, and then not so many in the middle. And then the wonderful Mayazumi Roshi, ZCLA and Yokoji, established in 1967. This is Oriyoki at ZCLA. So these are temples associated with Maizumi Roshi lineage, this all have to, has a sort of mindful quality. And many, many in, in New York and the uh, Northeast, always many in California. Sometimes I think there are a lot in California and they should move over, but then Kurotaki-san grew up in a temple that has 33 on the same street. <laughs> so that's what we want. <laughs> and then Katagiri Roshi came to San Francisco Zen Center first, you know, an assistant priest, and then he wanted to stay or whatever people wanted him to stay. So he ended up in the Midwest. And this is Hokyoji, although they've recently built some new buildings at Hokyoji. So you all should go there. Everyone should go. I think um, sometimes people here in, well, everywhere, people are, are thinking, well, I don't want to go. It would disrupt them. Um, they, they haven't invited me. Maybe I shouldn't go. But please go. Go and visit every temple. And if you hear they're having a ceremony or something, go. This is how the connections are made. That was Katagiri Roshi. And Kobenchino Roshi, Otagawa. We keep meeting Otagawa. So there are a lot of people in uh, Japan in this important family. One of the things I heard when I was at Rinso in Rinso in a couple of weeks ago is the um, the other side. In America, we hear it's so nice these teachers come and then they teach us and we love them. When you're at the other temple, they say, why did they leave? they should have stayed or it would have been nice if they'd stayed and given their life energy here in this temple so it's that was an interesting side of it that i hadn't quite experienced before and i know that that was true of kobanchino roshi that his family did want him to come back and he declined so they tried very hard this is one of the um uh temples in santa fe or in taos new mexico beautiful temple and he did officiate at the wedding of Steve Jobs and Lorene. He, and uh, Steve Jobs is not responsible for introducing Zen to the West, though. There is that rumor. <laughs> <laughs> so these are just some facts about the dates of when people came, including, so Kobanchino, inclu including Shohaku Okamura Sensei from Antaiji, co-founded co Valley Zen Center, and then Sanshen Zen Center, and Akiba Gengo Roshi came to Tassajara and San Francisco Zen Center in 1982, is that correct? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and then he established Kojinan 
and is currently building Tempio's on an international Zen monastery in Lake County. And so I'll have pictures of that. It's good to see the faces of some of these wonderful teachers who've come to America. She uh, trained at Sojiji and then established Shasta Mountain, which is in this uh, Soto Zen lineage. Also, Koyusan has visited that, I believe. Yeah. So here are some, again, more graphics, Katagiri Roshi associated temples and sitting groups that I know of now. I, one of the things that's very helpful is as, as I travel around, people give me more information because they want to be remembered. Everybody wants to. So we're getting a little better coverage of the country. Is it is pretty impressive? Yeah. So this I showed in um, Japan and I haven't really changed it. I can update it, but just to show some of the teachers. And this is basically, I just chose the best photographs that people sent me. <laughs> <laughs> she will be here for the Jukaie and they will be here too for the Jukaie. They have entered Nirvana. Tassahara is in Mountain Monastery and uh, it's having difficulty now because of the fires and the pandemic. So all of our centers and monasteries are struggling with keeping open. Zen Mountain Monastery, Shugan Arnold coming? He can't come. So this is in upstate New York and it's really, really amazing. So they bought a, a Catholic retreat center that had fallen on hard times and then they've rebuilt it. And um, it's big expansive area with, um, lots of trees. So they're basically self-sustaining now. Have you visited there? Oh, I encourage you all. It's very, very nice, very quiet. And Great Vow in Oregon, also big. They bought a, um, an elementary school and, re and turned it into a zendo and residential monastery. They have an, a beautiful Jizo walk up in there and uh, you can walk around and uh, many, many, many Jizo statues. Jizo is very important to Chosen Sensei because she was born on uh, a significant day. She was born on August 9th, which is the day that um, Nagasaki was bombed. I was born on August 6th, which is the day of Hiroshima. So I think that in the connections of our practice with our life experience, is very mysterious. And when they bought this elementary school, uh, when we would go at the beginning, the showers were down here because there was no elementary <laughs> school and the toilets were down here. So, but now over the years, they've changed things and now the showers are up here. So, you know. <laughs> it's very, they, everybody just keeps going step by step by step to improve and take care of our temples. Ryumonji is in the Midwest, and Shokin Weinkoff is devoted to his teacher, Katagiri Roshi, and he built a classic monastery. He, he, when he was at um, uh, Zuioji's International Temple, he asked for the plans, and so they gave him the plans, and then they used a lot of salvaged wood in the States. So they found big pieces of salvaged lumber and they built a, a Japanese style Zen monastery and they, they made their own bell. They got a lot of lead or something, whatever iron and dug a hole and they made their own boncho bell. So the first homemade boncho bell in America, I'm pretty sure. Great Tree Women's Monastery in North Carolina, Tejo Munich. Katagiri Roshi, Yokoji in LA, or not in LA, but in California. This is a wrong photo. I will fix that, but this is an ordination there. This is the fire that caused them to leap to protect their, their monastery. And then the next year there were floods as the mud flooded into their building. 
all shapes and sizes. So one of the, again, in terms of the present and future, one of the things that all of our centers do is address the interests of our surrounding. And so Green Gulch Farm um, has nice farmland. And so one of the things they created was a, an apprentice uh, organic farming program. So lots of people come to learn how to do organic farming and then they stay to become Zen students. So not everyone stays to become a Zen student. They come to learn organic farming. They benefit from the Zen practice and then they go out or they stay. That's one of their main sources of new students. This is Xiaoshan and the Taiyaku priest who trained in Japan and came back, she basically hand built her little monastery and it's beautiful. And Tom Matsuda and his wife are up there. He's a really great sculptor and artist. And I think he recently retired from teaching art at one of the colleges. So he carved a lot of statues for them. He carved a Jizo statue for Houston Zen Center. And he also carved our big sign. We mailed him a big piece of local pecan wood, which didn't cost very much to mail. You just take it to UPS and then you mail this piece of wood. And then it came back carved with Shounji uh, with the calligraphy by Kaz Tanahashi. So the sign in Houston was calligraphed by Kaz, who lives in California, carved in Vermont by Tom Matsuda, and then hung in. Isn't that great? This is an example of what, um, what was her name again? Kamoi Moria. Moria. When she was talking about the um, hidden history of how much travel there was across America by Japanese ministers in the early days. So that really happened. And Japanese people, Japanese American people also have traveled all across this country. And we keep these connections. So this that story of the sign and this story is an example of continual travel. And that's something that we should keep doing. We need to keep our connections very strong. Um, don't want to forget. It will come to my mind. So this is Xiao Shan's Shin San Shiki. And uh, this is uh, Ken Zan, who is now the abbot because Taihaku passed away just about 18 months ago. And so then we all went up. Akibaroshi led the funeral for her, which, you know, everybody came together for this ceremony, which is something we need to do for each other. We all come to, as we're doing at Zen Shuji now. Here's Nambara san. Here is Valley Zendo. Yeah, Asian. Asian san. Asian. We all came for this. Here's Tom Matsuda and his wife. And. Ken's on various people, her teacher, many, many people. Sorry, I should go on. It's fun to look at. We, it's so important to recognize our friends in these photos. And one of, our, one of the speakers said that she, her project is preserving these wide uh, photographs. I think that's so important. Oops, I'll give you a copy. And Reverend Daigaku Mume and uh, um, so St. Louis, Missouri, though, the first teacher there was uh, Yoshida Roshi. So he established the Missouri Zen Center, and then a group uh, moved from Missouri Zen Center and started another group, and, and Daigaku Sensei decided to go there and be the teacher. And as he said in his lecture, there are now like five groups in St. Louis, which is wonderful, quite surprising, actually. But maybe they'll soon be 33, all on the same street. So this is Houston. This is where I am. This is our building. And this is an ordination of Reverend Yozan. That's me. And um, these are some children. All of us uh, reach out to children. And, of course, we're not pressuring them to be Buddhists, but they love our ceremonies. This is in Oregon and mountain seat ceremony at Dharma Rain. This place, they had bought this land and they're slowly putting up the buildings. They've got three buildings up now. 
Kakumyo is their new abbot, but they their main focus on, is on teaching children. So they have a Dharma school that they've been doing for 20 years. So all little kids up to age 18 when they graduate, and it's their main focus. They don't do Ango, they do do Seshin. Their main focus is the Dharma school. Everybody who practices there takes care of the Dharma school. So that's different places respond, yeah. And this is Dharma combat at Buddha Eye, Ajo's, Ajo San's temple. Good photo, isn't it? American Zen. And this is the mountain seat ceremony in Houston. That's arriving at the front gate. Buddha Eye Temple, Ajo San with his teacher and many people that you would recognize. Ajo San. Sonoma Mountain Zen Center. Nyoze will be coming, is that right? Yes, good. And we saw him at Sozenji. Did we? No. And uh, Chapel Hill, Josho. Josho Roshishi will be coming. She's one of the first people who left San Francisco Zen Center to start a new center. So she moved completely across the country to start this center. And I remember, it's been a long time now, but I was at San Francisco Zen Center when that happened. And I, like everyone, thought, why did she leave? We didn't understand. You, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to eventually start your own center. So mm -hmm. she will be coming here for the Jukaye, and I, I honor her as my big Dharma sister. And I also would say, this is one of the significant things about American Zen. So many centers are run by women. And one of the things that we have, one of the barriers that we have leap, leapt over is that division between men and women. And I think it's our job to really bring the teachings of, of Shakyamuni Buddha and Kazan and, and Dogen Zenji's to life. And that means transcending all of these boundaries in genders and age and in, uh, in the future, most people will be in their 40s in America and in Japan. So in the 60s, when Suzuki Roshi and Maizumi Roshi came, most people in America were 25. So everybody who came to the Zen centers was 25. And then people at that time then thought, that's what Zen centers should be, people who should be, they are young, they're 25. And now lots of people across the country say, Everybody who's coming to my Zen center is 45 or 50. Is that a problem? And I and that's not a problem. People are ready to make that step in their lives. And we have a population that is largely that age. So, and people in their 50s will, are going to live for 40 more years so they can take care of the Zen centers. So sometimes when I was putting the pictures together to take to Japan, I was thinking, I can't show this picture. Everybody in it has white hair. They'll get the wrong idea. But in a way, they're getting the right idea. So that's Chapel Hill. And again, Dharma Rain. This is um, Great Tree Women's Monastery doing children's activity, Oriyoki for the kids. This is yoga class in Santa Fe. Tea ceremony at Great Tree. And this is, we have this practice of sewing our own rakasus. I'm not wearing one now, but most people in Suzuki Roshi lineage sew their own rakasus. So we have lots of sewing teachers around the country who are teaching people how to make rakasus. This happens to, this is Blanche Hartman. She was an abbot at San Francisco Zen Center. She also has passed away. And I want to say something about Kaz Tanahashi for the record. This is Kaz teaching calligraphy in Houston. But I think four people in the lecture series quoted, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self because it's so key. That, that translation that I just recited was made by Kaz and Robert Aiken in the 60s. So Kaz is a really important translator in America. And he translated the whole Shobo Genzo of course, we're, we'll soon have the Shumucho version, which will be very great. 
so does in text translation, but he devoted his life to Dogen Zenji and without him we wouldn't be trans we wouldn't be reciting Genjo Koan all the time and many other things that, has, that he has translated. So this person is very important and it's one of the reasons why American Zen has so much in, in English and eventually we're going to have to have it in Spanish also because people are drawn in. The words are very mysterious. It's not that we've really reduced the effort it will take to understand. The words are mysterious, but we have a hand to hold to understand. Genjo Koan. Um, Kaz is the son of a Shinto priest, and his older brother took over the temple. And Kaz was um, kind of lost after the war. He was a, apparently a wild young man. I mean, you know, lost. And he studied Aikido with the founder of Aikido, Master O. And then came to the States in the 60s and practiced with Robert Aiken in, in Hawaii. And then came here. And I, I asked him one time, uh, or I said, uh, well, you're a Buddhist. And, and he said, I'm not a Buddhist. He's devoted to Dogen, but he's a Shinto person. Very important person. And I think we, I have taken his work for granted sometimes, but he's still practicing hard. This I just put to amuse the people in Iwate, <laughs> Cowboy Zen, ordination in Great Tree, children in Great Tree. This is a Jukai in uh, Upaya. One of their main focuses, and here is Kushiki-san. He won't be able to come, but that's Kushiki. He goes to Upai a lot. They, um, they focus a lot of their practice on uh, chaplaincy training. So they have a big chaplaincy program, and people come and sign up for the chaplaincy training, and then they receive Jukai as part of it. These are many ways to enhance our practice. Back to California, Zen Heart Sangha. And now really back home, Zen Shuji. <laughs> and this, this is a photo from the 90th, 90th anniversary, which I came to, and that was really fun. So Goji now. Oh, that was a meeting. Can I go back? This is a meeting at Sokoji of the ASCB. So there's Nambara-san and Asian, and being very attentive. Gyoke-sama. I just had Long Beach Buddhist Church, but now he's at Sozen Sozenji also. All being Zen Sangha in Washington, DC. Um, taking care of people with disabilities is a big challenge in America, so we're all trying to take that into account. Berkeley Zen Center, um, very thriving, very old. Suzuki Roshi ordained Sojin Roshi at Berkeley Zen Center in order to get it established. And this is one of the things that we started at Houston Zen Center, and I'm I'm, I'm happy to say it's a very important outreach for us. So we, we were doing introduction to Zen and one day a week or one day a month, we would just say, come, here's how you do Zazen, see you later. And it didn't really work. People would come and learn how to sit and then they wouldn't come back. So we decided to have a series of classes because then people would have to come back six times in a row. And then they would establish a little cohort, like almost like the people you'd done Sashin with. And then when they came on a regular day, there would be people that they recognized. So now we do that for six weeks. Now we do it for five weeks. And we include some things about Zen and teachings, but mostly it's just to get people used to being in a room together and sitting still. And sometimes we call it mindfulness. But now people, even in the medical center, will recommend go take that meditation class at Houston Zen Center. They're very soft. They don't force you to be a member. 
they just show you how to do some meditation. So, and we charge money for it, but, um, and anybody who asks, I give them the whole curriculum. So I gave it to Daigak Rume Sama, and he brought it here. So it's a very, very good program. Brooklyn Zen Center, they're building a new monastery in upstate New York, Ancestral Heart Monastery. And he was coming, but he had to cancel because he's pretty sick. But they have, their main emphasis is diversity. Their main emphasis is people of color and equitable pricing. They have this very sophisticated uh, questionnaire to make their prices equitable. Chapel Hill again. And Tempiozan. I need to get some new new pictures of this. So this will be a, a monastery where we can all go. And that will be very important. This is the association that has met here and it, it took a significant step. It started inviting people who hadn't done all their training in Japan. I think our first meeting was here, the Association of Soto Zen Buddhists. And we meet every year. Out of that came the Soto Zen Buddhist Association. And it was meant to establish a way for American trained people to meet together and connect with Japan. But now it's become very strong, but very separate. So now we're inventing a new one. This is our kind of introduction ceremony. This is our version of Zuise here in the West. And here's Houston Zen Center. And it says, congratulations to Zen Shuji members from Houston Zen Center members. Thank you for leading the way. So a couple of things I'd like to say about the future, because again, I have been so moved by this series and I, I took Kojima Sensei's recommendation to think about the future seriously. So I thought about the future. Mm -hmm. What I would say is um, the future is emerging and it's in our hands. We have it. And some key issues I think about that we have to keep in mind are restoring our connections to our roots, which means learning more about all the roots and branches. So the work that Duncan Williams is doing and, and Professor Kurashige may be doing too. All of this is information we need to um, deeply study. And living up to the teachings of the Buddha and Dogen and Keizan Zenji, so leaping beyond our imaginary delusional boundaries and deepening our understanding of sameness and difference, Sandokai, that's in our hands, to leap beyond the differences because we're seeing a lot of division in our society. And we have the teachings that can help people leap beyond. So we really need to live the teachings of Keizan Zenji, taking Zen to everyone, guided by the dreams. Keizan Zenji was gu guided by dreams. And in practical terms, increase communication and gatherings among sanghas in the same city, county, world like this. Increase that. There's a little bit too much separation in America sometimes. We don't know what's in North Carolina. We should know all these things, or we could if we want. We will make the effort and keep reaching across sectarian divisions from, uh, from other Buddhist communities. I really liked seeing the, the Honganji ministers. We need to keep leaping across those boundaries. And again, just to say, in 50 years, people will be standing up here appreciating that Zen Shuji is still here and thriving. And they will say, I came because someone here touched me and I wanted to join. I know we all respect our, our children and try not to make them choose, but that makes it sort of harder for us. The, uh, so therefore, it's up to us to spread these teachings. Thank you very much. Question so, would time. you like to take questions from the audience? I'm uh, happy to. So. Question. Um, what is your name again? Uh, Sunil. Sunil. Nice to see you again. Um, so you talk in the, in the title says American Zen. So we have you know Japanese Zen, Korean Zen. What would be like one or two things that would mark American Zen? It happens in America. 
That's one. Sorry, is that two? Where can I help? <laughs> oh, three. Oh, three. <laughs> okay, that including the first. Well, again, it's it's American uh, karma, and I there was a a great teacher, Professor um, Jaini, who would come to Tassajara. He was at Berkeley Zen Center, uh, Berkeley, excuse me, Berkeley, UC Berkeley, and he would come to Tassajara and give lectures to the students every summer. And he said there are 12 kinds of karma. So there's your personal karma of just this body, your family karma, your city count karma, your country karma, 12 kinds of karma. And so the people who end up in, on, in this land have all of that karma. And people who live stay on, on the various islands, the many islands of Japan, have lots of karma. So American Zen just has to take into account the incredible, complicated, and rich karma of being here. So I think it was just a location device that I used that term. Because what's happening at Zen, Zen Shuji is kind of different from what's happening even at Sokoji, ZCLA, Montebello has many different features. Um, I, I, so I'm not, I don't think I can answer, I don't think I want to reduce it to one thing, American Zen. It's just what we're trying to do. Yeah, is that okay? <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Can I follow up on that one? Yes, um, on. So my question would be, do you want to get in front of the camera? No, no. That, that, everyone, as long as everyone can hear this question, um, how has American Zen changed over the different generations? Ooh, good what, question. What pattern? What would you think would be the main pattern? That's such a good question, because the first practitioners who followed the um, the founders, like Suzuki Roshi and Katagiri Roshi and Maizumi Roshi. The first students who followed them really tried to copy their teacher. And we have this other organization in, in the States called uh, American Zen Teachers Association. And that was founded by people who were the first generation of people who weren't their, their teach from their teacher's country. So it includes people who had Japanese teachers, Korean teachers, Tibetan teachers, Chinese teachers, and they all got together to talk about how are we going to take care of our teacher's lineage when we're not from our teacher's country. So the first generation, in, and includes Tenshin Roshi and Shokin Roshi and Chosen, they're all coming for this Jukaie. They really made a big effort to do it just like their teachers did. Keep the language, keep the movements, and but their bodies are different. And so it has relaxed over time and different deshi are keeping it in different way, ways. Like Shokin Roshi in, uh, in uh, uh, Rimonji, they still do everything in Japanese or Sino-Japanese. So nobody understands what they're saying at all. Isn't that true? Even Japanese people don't understand kanji, zaibo, satsugyo. So, Shokin has really dedicated himself to keeping um, his teacher's vision. But most people have realized that um, the next generation after them doesn't want to be, can't, can't follow that strict way if they're not inspired by the living body of that teacher. So there have been adaptations and they're very creative, very creative. And I, I don't think they're too creative, do you? I mean, it's not, we're not giving something up. We're trying to hold something. So watching, going, one of the privileges I have is I go to various centers and see what they've changed and I get to feel, is that okay to change that or is that not okay? So one of the things I feel is really important is orioki. And yet there are some temples who've given it up and I think, no, we shouldn't give that up. So orioke is important, but maybe 50 minute periods of zazen isn't so important. And sitting in a chair is okay. So people are experimenting all over the country and that's why we need to come together because then we can feel what we really should return to and what it's okay not to take care of. Um, 
so I've seen a lot of creativity, but the heart is still the same. People are really still really, really, they feel the heart of their teachers and their lineage. And Dogen and Kazan, people are really still devoted to those teachings. And so again, the having access to the language, I think, is very important. Translations. So a good thing that has happened over time is that graduate students majored in in translation and study. And so some of our, our great resources are the graduate students who just go to school for scholarly reasons, but then they come out with these great translations. So it's our practice has grown, even in my lifetime, there used to be just a few books. We'd get so excited, oh, there's another Zen book. And now there's a thousand books, but we, we keep each other informed about which ones are the good ones to read. Is that okay answer? We can we can talk later. We'll talk <laughs> later. <laughs> it's a long conversation. Are there questions on in the chat? Oh, chat. Okay. No question in a chat. Or if you can have the a question unmute, then ask the question. Can you hear me? Yes. Did you learn anything about Zen in America? In this audience? Yeah. Were, what, what surprised you? Uh, I didn't know all about the Zen center, like how they do it and, and the different <laughs> style. Uh -huh. And it's very interesting. And I was thinking, well, maybe it should be a, somewhere, like a book or something to go through all the, you know, to gather all together. And uh, it's a, you know, interesting style of some, like farming, some like schools, children's school. That's all. I think people will be interested to know more. But yeah, that's can you, a good idea. Can you repeat your question to the audience? What's your name? Oh, oh you're Atsuko. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for the beautiful flyers. Ah, yeah, I saw you briefly at Sozenji. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Atsuko san suggested uh, that it might be good to have a book with a, a lot of these images and information because people don't know what's happening across the country. I agree. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting for me because I, I, you know, I love to travel and visit the centers and then, and Taiga-san and I go to a lot of centers. And one of the things that we um, have learned is I can call up and say, we'd like to come and visit you at you name it, Ryumonji or Ancestral Heart Temple, and they say, why? So <laughs> we've, so now we learn, we have to say, well, we're not trying to come and deliver the correct teaching to you. We just want to come and practice with you a little bit and just see how it's going. And so one of my efforts has been to reach out and say, please send me pictures of your group and um, tell me what's going on. And Sometimes it's hard. Everybody's so busy everywhere. They barely have time to send me a picture. And I think uh, we share it in America, in the United States, we share that with Japan. Everybody's working on so many fronts. We're all trying so hard to both keep our core practice vital and going and respond to the needs, different needs of our communities. So it's very impressive what people are doing. Really impressive. Yeah, a, a book would be good. Thank you. Yeah. I had a question. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Nikki. Um, so, uh, I mean, healthcare and, and mindfulness is very much uh, incorporated now in the for the past decade into right. healthcare, many different aspects of it. I'm wondering, in your opinion, mindfulness separate from the dharma and separate from the buddhist practices um how does that how does that change the the the, the true teaching and does that uh, i don't know that, that does that work the same way with that is that something lost in there in, in, in the practice of it separate from uh buddhism 
Great question. That's a really great question. And I've, uh, I've been watching that very closely. And at first, uh, I mean, we realized that the teaching of mindfulness was really important right away. And it's sort of like the way yoga was separated out from a spiritual practice or Tai Chi was separated out. And there's even a magazine called Mindfulness. And if you write an article for it, you're not supposed to use the word Buddhist. Did you know that? They will reject an article if it says Buddhist <laughs> because they don't want it to be off-putting to any other religion. And so there's been a pretty concerted effort to separate mindfulness from Buddhism in order to give the benefits to people. And at first, I, I thought that was kind of sad because the rest of our Buddhist teachings are so rich and important. I thought, shouldn't you have the whole package? But uh, I, I think I've relaxed. I mean, I have relaxed about that. So I think that if mindfulness helps people, good. And so I feel okay, however they're teaching it. But when anybody asks me about it, I say, you know, that is a Buddhist practice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason, it, and then why is it right next to mindfulness? And why, I mean, why is mindfulness in these lists? And you study the adjacent qualities. It's very interesting. Um, so I think a lot has been lost in terms of, in Buddhist terms, in the teaching of mindfulness. It's very goal-oriented, and it's very dualistic, but if that's what people need to, to calm their minds, it's a lot like the original teachings of dana, which is, you know, you give material goods, because people can't learn the teachings until they have relief from hunger or, or want and then fearlessness, and then dharma. So one of the precept of not being possessive of dharma is when people are ready, you give them dharma. But the Lotus Sutra says, oh, I could go on about the Lotus Sutra now. The Lotus Sutra says, if people aren't ready for the teachings, you don't give it to them because it will scare them. So this, I feel this teaching about mindfulness is a little like that. They need mindfulness and stress relief, and the Buddhist teachings might might push them away. We don't teach mindfulness at Houston Zen Center, but we mention it a lot in the Buddhist context. Is that okay? It's beautiful. We can keep talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is one question at the chat. What is the most common question you receive from the people introduced to Zen? I often get asked if someone can practice them if they believe in God? I get asked that question too, but that's not the most common question. The most common question um, is, what is that on your neck? <laughs> <laughs> and so when we're teaching Introduction to Zen, I don't wear it because I find it's too distracting. So I, I just appear, you know, without the, the rock suit, but it's always, what is that? And the second most common question is, why do you shave your head? Mm -hmm. And then um, Akiba Roshi gave me the best answer the last time that happened when we were in Atlanta. He said, it's, I, it, this isn't the answer I gave. I gave a long-winded answer. But Akiba Roshi said, it's like um, cutting off delusions. They will come back. So you cut them off again. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. And uh, I don't get asked very often about whether you can practice in if you believe in God, but I do. When I am, I say yes. I say yes. You can practice in if you believe in God. You can practice in if you believe in all sorts of things. Belief systems are compatible. So... Nikki. As, a, as a novice, and I apologize for such a uh, such a bad question, perhaps. But you just said you, know, you can practice, um, you know, regardless of your religion or if you please. What and, and what is the essence of the Zen that you say everyone can practice, whether they believe in or don't don't believe in uh, other religions? Well, yeah. What is the essence of Zen that everyone can practice? Or maybe why is it, how is it compatible? Oh, no, the essence that I think people can practice is 
kind of what I said earlier, this what uh, Dogen Zenji and Keizan Zenji and Shakyamuni Buddha said, we have to leap beyond categories. So everybody walks into a Zen center with all sorts of categories. Men are like this, women are like this, genders are like this, God is like this. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I must make more money. Everybody has lots of beliefs, but they can just sit down and learn and settle. And then when I first started practicing at San Francisco Zen Center, I just wanted to sit. I didn't go up to services. I didn't go to um, ceremonies. Maybe that's one of the nice things that Zazen Kai can do. It can give us just a place to sit. And then if you want to, you go start going to the services, ceremonies. And I loved that when I started going. Bowing was just such a purifying practice. But I think our, the doors of our Zen centers have to be open to anyone. We have people at Houston Zen Center who are believing um, uh, Muslims. And so they, they won't go to the ceremonies, but they really like Zen. So, so the essence is the leaping beyond categories. Is that okay? <laughs> is there another question for the Okay. Um, what would you be your answer about someone asking you about the lax? Any anecdotes? So, so what would be your answer about someone asking about the Rakusu and any anecdotes? About the Rakusu? Well, maybe it just says any anecdotes. You can read it there. Okay. Um, I, I give them a history of the sewing. It's these, these are beautiful records. And, you know, it, it's the record of rice patties. I love it that it's a record of terraced rice fields. And the Buddha said, where make make that to identify yourself as a follower of, of me, of Buddha, make your robe like that. So the full on okesa looks like a terraced rice field. And when you, you've, you've all been on terraced rice fields, have you, in Japan? They're fantastic. They're a tremendous amount of careful, diligent work. And so to make a rakasu is to devote yourself to careful, diligent attention to detail. And also, the, I could go on because fabric itself is very precious, and it's a little bit in the province of women. So the rakasu and sewing and careful, diligent work is a little bit identified with the female, feminine side. And so it's a beautiful record of that, I feel. Doshin. So I was a chaplain resident at uh, the Veterans Hospital in Hawaii. And La Jolla. I was in La Jolla. Oh, That's where my father lived, ah. grew up. It was a very small fishing village yeah. when he was there. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Coast coast of California. It's any place is gorgeous. Um, and I wore my Rana suit uh, in the mental health ward. And uh, I had some of the veterans tell me that it looked like a bulletproof vest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so we had nice conversations <laughs> about bullets and bulletproof vests mm. and war healing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it can be a great conversation piece depending on the context. Yeah. And I enjoyed that one. Thank you. <laughs> so add that to your reference. Thank you. That's a good anecdote. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Uh, there is another question. How do you define the word Zen? <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Well, depending on the um, so chaplaincy. Chaplaincy is a very different practice in the West. I suppose originated in the West and 
was struggling perhaps or, or just beginning to sprout in the East in many different ways. And um, there is an interfaith component to being a chaplain in the United States and America. And it's, um, it's not easily understood, I think, mm. uh, between East and West. Mm. And I was just wondering, because it is, um, it, it's maybe one of the ways that I came to Buddhism mm. and uh, through hospice work. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would just, I kind of struggle with uh, explaining sometimes to uh, individuals that are rooted in the Eastern tradition of, of Buddhism what chaplaincy is and mm -hmm. how it is very compatible with teachings mm -hmm. and um, and a an outreach effort mm -hmm. for the teachings um, and um, so I'm kind of struggling with with explaining and understanding being able to explain chaplaincy mm -hmm. Buddhist chaplaincy mm -hmm. to other Buddhists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and frequently, the sole Buddhist chaplain with other chaplain colleagues. Yeah. So I do a lot of explaining what Buddhism is to non-Buddhists. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes explaining chaplaincy to other Buddhists is um, maybe an East-West. Maybe we're not quite there yet in mm -hmm. terms of our experience and how we can share that understanding. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to present that as, as something that, that I'm struggling with mm -hmm. and see if you had any advice. It's, it's such an important question, what chaplains are, and it's, it's really percolating right now. It's a very current issue. Uh, one thing in terms of inter-country um, understanding, it's we're we're embedded in two different situations. So in in Houston, they're really some of the hospitals are really actively seeking out Buddhist chaplains because they're Buddhist patients. There's a large um, Vietnamese and Chinese and Thai population in tech in Houston, not very few Japanese people, but lots of Thai and Vietnamese and um, Chinese people. And the hospital, it's a very Christian part of the world. And people aren't so comfortable when a Christian walks in to comfort them in a health crisis. So I think that's hard to imagine in Japan. Mm -hmm. So that they're, you know, the, the bias toward Christianity is so strong. And I've been in situations where we were called in because the patient was really upset that a Christian came in and didn't understand their needs. So we can, we work across any, we just bring Kanon. Kanon speaks to everybody everywhere. So Wanyan, you just say these words and you chant. I chant Shosai Myokichi Jodorani or Enmei Juku Kanon Gyo, just a chanting and having some Juzu and you you meet. So it's been very helpful. We had to do a fair amount during the pandemic too on Zoom comforting families in the hospitals. So we just have a different context and that's unimaginable in Japan. So of course they would be comforted by their families and friends or a minister if they asked, but in America people are so um, left to struggle with this cold medical environment. The chaplains are the ones who bring some warmth into the situation. And the Buddhist chaplains in Houston are able to also go in and see Christians, but it doesn't go the other way. It's been very interesting. And then there was a question about whether Buddhist chaplains should serve in the army. That's been a question that is difficult for some centers. But other people feel it's natural. Of course, you should also be a chaplain in the army. And prisons, we do prison work. We go into the prisons. I wear my Roxu in prison. It's true. They really like it. 
Um, so prison chaplains are important and we, they reach out to us because we're willing to go there. We aren't prison chaplains, but it helps. There are a lot of prisoners in, in Texas who are Thai and not so many Japanese, lots of Chinese gang members who are in prison for the rest of their life. So we go. Chaplaincy is very important. Yeah, thank you. There should be more of you. Thank you for your work. Uh, um, as you know, you might have heard Doshin's talk and Daigaku Sensei's talk mm -hmm. and Yoko Yamada's talk. Mm -hmm. It was about how they came to Zen. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can give us the five minute version of how you <laughs> walked into San Francisco Zen Center and then eventually became received Tokudo. Five minutes. <laughs> this is a very difficult <laughs> question. Oh. <laughs> I can do it faster. Um, I, um, well, as I said at the beginning, you know, Amy and a few other people mentioned the impact of the 60s. And those of you, all the rest of you are too young, but the, the 60s was a big thing in the States. It was a huge time of reevaluating everything, and everybody wanted to drop categories. So everybody felt channeled in categories. And in, in my high school, um, all the boys were being drafted. If you weren't going to college, you were going to go to Vietnam. And none of them wanted to do it. It was a very mysterious, horrible time. It really was a hard time. And it's kind of been forgotten, but that changed me. And when by the time I went to school at UC Berkeley, um, which was just slightly north of where I grew up, I knew that I wanted to do something that would be of service to the world. And I thought politics and things like that. And people in my, in my friend group in college were going to see Suzuki Roshi. They're going across the bay. And I thought, ah, religion. But then um, a while later, not that long, but a while later, uh, I felt something was missing in my life, something on the spiritual side. And I was living in San Francisco. Everything was great. You know, people say that, oh, I have a great life. <laughs> I was, I was very happy, but, or whatever. I was doing well as a human. And, but something was missing in the spiritual side. And since I was raised a Catholic, I, I went to churches and I was traveling a lot um, with friends and family. And so I would go to churches in, in Europe, Catholic churches. And the feeling was very great. It was just like being here, the feeling of high ceilings and spirituality permeating the whole fabric. So it felt good, but the Catholic church isn't very good about women. And I didn't want to go back into the Catholic church with its very harsh treatment of women. And I, even then, I remember it, I still feel it, sad for the Catholic Church because they don't understand how that is going to eventually um, need to be changed. It needs to be changed. And so I was left with that. And then I was studying the mind and the mind's limitations. And a friend of mine said, um, you should try meditation. And the only one I knew about was San Francisco Zen Center. So I went there and thought, oh, this is really weird. And I went in and uh, Reb Anderson was actually there, Tenshin Roshi, and he turned toward the door and he smiled at me. And I thought, oh, this is okay. They smile here. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went down and another person who's still a friend was doing Zazen instruction. So I sat down and, and uh, I had earrings and you know makeup and punky hair. And um, so I sat down and I immediately liked Zazen. This was very good. And so I went back the next day, but it was Sunday and Zen Center, San Francisco Zen Center was closed. So then I went home. And then after that, every day for Zazen. And then uh, I was assigned, there's Soji after service. I was going to service by then. And I was given the job of cleaning the toilets, which I want to do tomorrow here. I want to clean this toilet back here. 
Um, so I was given the job of cleaning the toilets. So I was in there cleaning the toilets. And somebody said to me, oh, they must think you're going to be a priest. <laughs> <laughs> they don't give that job to just anyone. So I it had never crossed my mind. But then from then on, it was this pretty... And I thought that I would live, I went to Tassajara after that. I, I did the job. Somebody else in this lecture series said, you take care of what you have to take care of. I took care of everything and then moved to Tassajara. And I stayed there for a long time. And I thought that I would be a monastic for a long time. I liked all of the work. I liked all of the, I became the plant manager. So I got to take care of all the systems and the septic systems. I loved that kind of service. But then I, they started inviting me to um, Houston to go and do classes and teach sewing. So I went and I would come out home, go there, come back to Tassajara. And they, then they kept saying, please move to Houston. And I said, no, Tassajara. And there's one more anecdote. This is kind of a good anecdote. Um, we were having an anti-war protest and uh, people from San Francisco were walking across the bridge. People from Marin County were walking and everybody was in their finery. And we were going to hold hands with all of our robes to protest invading Iraq, you know, and it was beautiful. And then on the walk back to Green Gulch, I was walking with an Episcopalian minister. He had very bright red hair. And he said, uh, what's your calling? And we don't talk about that in Zen, calling. So I, I kind of went deep. What's your calling? And I said, Houston is my calling. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm moving to Houston. <laughs> but still, I wasn't sure. So this shows what a kind of community person I am. I asked everybody, do you think I should move to Houston? What do you think? Do you think I should move to Houston? I've always lived in California. And everybody said, yes, move to Houston. So I moved to Houston. I gave them three conditions. We had to have a place where we could practice. And it had to have a place for me to live in because I wasn't going to live in an apartment after living at the monastery. And they had to have a year's worth of a stipend for me so that I didn't have to start fundraising immediately. And they met those three conditions in about six months. We, had this, we started in a little house, which had a little garage apartment for me and a year's worth of stipend, and 20 years later, I'm still there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Kojima. Thank, Thank you. This has been a very great... We are very honored series. to have you for that final. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're glad. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Kojima Sensei to close us out. Yeah. Okay, please. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for Konjin Sensei for the final lecture. And uh, I really appreciate for Lonson for coordinate for entire uh, series of these lectures. Okay. And Johnson and Asko-san, and everyone working hard to make it happen. Now we complete. And now going to celebrate the 100th anniversary. Are you ready? You know, uh, these 100 years, one minister from Japan came to LA. That is the first Soto Zen uh, established seat. Only four Japanese American immigrants at the time, at the living room. However, the Dharma spread out through the hundred years. Then all over the United States, all over the world, at this hundredth anniversary, we're going to have the Jukai. Then actually most of the participants have never experienced to be this temple. All our supposed to be a Dharma brother and sisters haven't met each other. We don't know each other, but came gather here at the original place to now know each other and work together. This is very meaningful. 
And this time, all the leadership was taken by the Americans, by our Americans hand to read the ceremony and participant, mostly Americans. That's uh, the my, a mild, a milestone of the hundred. And these communications makes the future. This relationship becomes a, fundament, a fundamental uh, relationship, makes another hundred for our future. Thank you very much. And this concludes all the hundred lecture series. Thank you.